All right. So here we are in the uh, sort of first of our inverted lectures. Um, and we're going to look at the classic case of Western Europe. And of course, part of the reason it's called the classic case is that it is the first case. It is the first part of the world that transitioned to the system that we now know and refer to as capitalism. But before we begin sort of the substantive aspect of today's lecture, um, we're just going to go over some administrative stuff. So just, you know, some of the stuff that we went over already in sort of the uh, Wednesday's lecture last week. Um, mostly for those of you um, as a reminder, but also for some of you that maybe weren't able to attend the lecture um, last Wednesday. So just a reminder, um, let's go back to the slideshow here. Make sure you sign up on Slack right right now, which is, I'm recording this Monday. There's about 113 of you out of uh, 150. It actually should say 150, not 136. Um, so make sure you sign up for it. For those of you, again, that missed Wednesday's lecture, the reason we're using Slack is it's just sort of an easier way to communicate and sort of uh, to post things. But the whole point of it is it's how you comment on the sort of weekly prompts, right? And as you know from the syllabus, a lot of your participation grade is not just the tutorials, which will begin um, not this week, but next week. Um, you have to comment on the things that are sort of prompted in the syllabus, right? So every every class we sort of have three, four, five, sometimes six questions, and you want to comment on those. You don't necessarily have to comment on all of the questions. Um, you can. I noticed some of you that went this week commented on all of them. Um, you can take a deep dive into one of them, um, or you can try to comment on all of them if you want. It's really up to you. It just depends on you know what you have to say, what in the reading really grabbed you, that kind of thing. The other reason we use Slack, of course, is for the extra credit. And the extra credit in terms of how it affects your grade is explained on the syllabus. Um, you basically can respond um, four times. Uh, we can sort of give you, you get sort of 1% each time. So for a maximum of 4% uh, towards your uh, final grade. And it's under the sort of COVID and capitalism uh, channel in uh, Slack. And as I explained, I think in last uh, lecture, the whole point of it is to get you to connect the themes of the course to um, things that are happening with uh, the pandemic and sort of what's changing um, in terms of uh, you know capitalism, its relation to the state, that kind of thing, but specifically the key concepts. So you don't just want to post something and say, "Oh well, you know, here's an article about uh, workers at a meatpacking plant in Calgary or in Missouri or wherever," um, and that's it. No, you have to sort of comment on it specifically. So you might connect it to probably not um, this lecture, but say the lecture on class and class formation. We'll talk a lot a bit about workers and how they relate to um, sort of the owners of production and that kind of thing. And you want to connect it specifically to what is actually working. How are they organizing? Is this collective bargaining? What are they striking over? Is it safety standards, which is probably the case if it's uh, COVID? So as the course goes on, that'll probably become a little bit more obvious on what to comment on specifically um, as we introduce sort of new concepts. And we'll be starting with that today. Now, the other thing, of course, uh, is the course reserves. Just a reminder um, for those of you that missed last Wednesday to access the course reserves, which is where all the readings for this course are, is, um, is. So here's a slide here on um, Quarkus. So you want to go to Library Course Reserves. You, know, you click on this. And then after that, you'll get this page here. And then so here we have sort of week two. And you can see all the other weeks. For week two, where did capitalism come from? You would just click on view. Now, sometimes it might ask you to type in your UTOR ID to access it again, because it's you know access to the library and you know there's copyright and all that kind of thing. So that's how you um, that's how you access the reading. Okay. So today we are looking at the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Um, why um, that transition happened, when it happened uh, specifically, and where it happened. And as the reading suggests, a lot of this transition takes place in England, um, specifically in the English countryside. But as the readings also make clear, it's not, even though it happens in England, in many ways it is a European-wide phenomenon, and we'll look at that a little bit later. A lot of things that become central features of what we think of as capitalism, banks, stock exchange, merchants, um, were not that well developed um, in England, especially in the early sort of um, late sort of feudal period. Um, what was developed in England and what did change in England was specifically relations between producers and expropriators on the English countryside. Um, but we'll get to that later, okay? So you don't have to understand too much of that right now. So let's look at the next slide here. So by way of introduction, what we're going to do is look at sort of four key concepts today that you'll have to know. Um, three of them are a bit more important um, 
and the fourth one. So we're going to look at historiography, the mode of production, relations of production, and also means of production. Now that will come a little bit later when we look at specifically the emergence of the factory system. But I, I just want to implant the idea of what means of production uh, is today. And it is distinct and different from mode of production, even though they sound similar. Again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. I'll have office hours also uh, this Wednesday from 11 till 12. Basically, I'll send out um, a Zoom, you know, just like I did for the first uh, lecture. I'll send out an email of, you know, how to access my office hours. And it'll be run through Zoom, same kind of thing. Okay, so first let's look at uh, historiography. So historiography, many of you are probably familiar with this concept, especially those of you that have, um, you know, our second, third, fourth year uh, students. Historiography, as I've got here, is it's the history of history, right? It's not just about the facts, it's the debates amongst historians. Historians, as most of you are aware, don't agree on everything, right? They have vigorous debates on why some things happen, when certain things happen. And a lot of that... Um, has to do with sometimes um, different archives and different sort of primary documents that they were able to found. But more often than not, it has to do with how they're approaching a particular episode or event in history. What analytical lens, what theory of history are they using, right? What sort of conceptual building blocks are they going to look at? So for example, if you are looking through the lens of gender, right, that might affect um, the way you think of a specific thing. So for example, if you're gonna look at gender in the development of capitalism in the 19th century, let's say, one of the things that even Marx um, often overlooked was say wage, was sort of unpaid wage labor. And um, for those of you, you could probably guess, a lot of it is in child rearing, right? Most women who have children in the 19th century, still to this day, there's a lot of things that are going on in terms of work in the production and raising of a family, but these things are sort of unpaid, right? So looking at it from a gender lens fills some gaps um, in the story. And there's other ways to look at it. You could look at it from the perspective of class conflict. You could look at it from the perspective of social history. You could look at it from the perspective of an economic lens, right? So there's different ways to look at it. So for our purposes, um, one historian here that is significant is Marc Bloch. Now, he was a French historian, um, was at the Sorbonne for a number of years uh, during the 1940s. Uh, even though he died in 1944, he actually was involved in the French resistance against the Nazi occupation. But for our purposes, he wrote sort of two um, works, um, 1920, 1939, Why a Serf, which is just kings and serfs, and Feudal Society in 1939. Now, what's significant about Marc Bloch is that he was basically the, one of the fathers of social history. Specifically, he founded a school of thought in um, French historiography um, with what we often refer to as the Annals School of History. Um, in 1929, he, with a few others, founded a journal called the Annals d'Histoire Économique et Sociale, basically the Annals of History and uh, the Annals of Economic and Social History. And it sort of had two things, right? Prior to the 1920s and Marc Bloch, most of history operated in what's called the Rankian tradition. Now, what that means is when history developed as a profession in the 19th and early 20th centuries, most historians look to the example of Leopold von Ranke, who is a historian, a German historian, mostly based at the University of Göttingen um, in Germany. And essentially, he looked at history from a sort of broadly political lens, right? It was also narrative history. You were telling a story about how history unfolded. And most of what he focused on was politics, or what is often referred to as the great man theory of history. Now, what that means is that historians tended to focus on sort of the great men of history, right? So if you were gonna talk about the French Revolution, you would probably focus on Napoleon or Maximilien Robespierre. Or if you were gonna look at the American Revolution, you'd focus on people like Washington and Jefferson, the leaders of armies and you know, um, government officials, presidents, uh, that kind of thing. And so by the 1920s, what Bloch does is he says, no, 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 actually what we should be focusing on is everyday regular people. And for a number of reasons, one, most of history is the history of everyday regular people. Imagine if you looked at history 150, 300 years from now, and you were looking at our time, and all you did was focus on people like Jeff Bezos, or Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, Xi Jinping, right? All of these leaders, right? You would get a certain picture of how society functioned, but 99% of the world doesn't live like those people. 
They have different concerns, right? They don't have as much power as they do. So you really have to focus on individuals in all aspects of society. And this is what happened in the 1920s with the Annals School. And it wasn't just about understanding the way history moved, but also giving life um, to the way history functioned in sort of everyday life. Right? What did you, how did you, you know, how did things work? And what was the typical day of a worker? What was the typical day of um, a peasant or somebody who toiled in the fields, right? It's a very different picture of society if you only focused on sort of the elites of society. Things would look a lot better. And even if you understood that a lot of people didn't live like that without seeing them, without seeing the struggle of everyday people, it leaves a lot of gaps in the story, right? Imagine looking at the history of the United States and not looking at the history of slavery or not specifically looking at how slaves spent their everyday life. Um, it paints a completely different picture of what American history would look like. The other thing that the Annals School did that for our purposes is important is they tended to look at history over what's referred to as the kind of lingerie of history, right? Long periods of time. Sometimes historians will focus on very specific episodes, right? If you want to understand, say, say you're looking at the Cold War and you're interested in the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? It's, it's 13 days in October. Well, what the Annals School does is it looks at sort of history over the lingerie, which is sort of what we're doing in this course, right? We're looking at the history of capitalism really going back to the 14th century. So we're talking six, 700 years of history. And for the purposes of this lecture, when I talk about feudalism, we're also going to look at, I mean, just very, very briefly, sort of the end of the Roman Empire. So we're talking 1,500 years where we're looking at how economic systems, starting in Europe, specifically Britain in the 14th century, how that changes and emerges to become the system we call capitalism. And you can't really understand how capitalism gets here without going back that far. So this is sort of also another legacy of the Annals School. Um, and it's also important to understand, as I said earlier, that historians disagree. Um, so another historian here we'll just look at briefly is a man named Rodney Hilton. Now, Rodney Hilton came up through Cambridge. He was part of um, an emerging sort of uh, school of thought um, that emerged from Cambridge University in the 1950s, uh, specifically Marxist interpretations of um, history, going all the way back to the medieval period, but all the way up until the 19th and 20th century. And as you can probably guess, for those of you that have any familiarity with sort of Marxist theory and thought, the focus is on class conflict, right? And when we get to Marx, which we will in a couple of weeks, his sort of focus of history was that it's actually the conflict between classes that drives history. It's sort of the prime mover. And Rodney Hilton was very much in that tradition. So in the 1970s and the 1980s, I mean, he was publishing in the 1950s as well, he basically argued that the, the key thing in the transition from feudalism to capitalism was class conflict between producers and appropriators. And what I mean by that is, say, people that work the land versus people that expropriate value from the land, right? Peasants and lords, that kind of thing. Conflict between them created the conditions that led from feudalism to capitalism. Now, what I mean by prime mover is that there's something that without which it wouldn't have happened. Now, of course, as most of you have probably guessed at this point in history, there are many reasons why a specific event unfolds the way it does. And often what historians disagree on is like, yeah, okay, I understand there's many different kinds of um, you know, events, uh, people, classes that contribute to a specific thing happening, but what is the prime mover? And for Rodney Hilton, that was class conflict. So it just, just gives you an under sort of a sense of um, how historiography works. So let's look at the other concepts. Now the other concept of mode of production and means of production. Now mode of production is, is essentially, it's not exactly the same thing, but similar to the kind of economic system. So the mode of production would be feudalism. Another mode of production would be capitalism. Now this is a little bit different from the means of production. Now the means of production is how things get produced. What do you need in order to produce something? So in the case of feudalism, a lot of the means of production was land. Who owned land? Who had access to land? Maybe some tools, but it was mostly land. And in that case, I'll get into it a little bit later, it, it, it's complicated. Now under capitalism, the means of production is capital, right? Who has access to capital? And capital, yes, in many ways is money, but it's not just money. It's also things like tools, right? When you go to work at a factory, you're making something, but you don't own 
the tools that allow you to make it, right? So that's sort of means of production. The other concept we're looking at is relations of production. Now, relations is between the people that make something happen. So in the context of feudalism, it would be between serfs and lords. Serfs are the people who work the land, who actually produce the agricultural product, right? Lords then basically take that surplus land. That's how the feudal system worked. And I'll explain a little bit later after this sort of first video how the feudal system worked. And you can think about it more, if you want to think of it a bit more generally, it's workers and owners. Now under capitalism, it would be the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Okay? So this is essentially what we're going to look at today. So these are the sort of four concepts that you want to familiarize yourself with. The most important ones are historiography, mode of production, and relations of production. You want to understand means of production a little bit, but we'll get into that a little bit later in a few lectures from now. But I've just put it in here to introduce the concept. Okay. So this is, these are the key things to look at. So I'm going to pause here, and in the next video, we'll look at what feudalism is as a social and an economic order. And that's sort of key as well. For those of you that have studied, say, economics, or maybe those of you that come out of management, you tend to look at things, understandably so, through a purely economic lens. And that's okay. Um, you can't really understand the history of capitalism without that economic lens. But what you also want to do is add another layer to the picture of the history of capitalism. And that's a lot of what we're going to do in this course. You have to understand capitalism as also a social system. It's not just an economic system. It's also a social system. If you think of your daily lives today, right, every aspect of what you do is in some ways mediated through the rules and laws of capitalism, right, whether it be the market or what have you, right? So there's a social relationship between worker and boss, under feudalism between serf and lord, that kind of thing. All right. So that, that sort of concludes the first sort of um, um, bit of the lecture. And I'll pause the video here. And then so the next one we'll look at specifically feudalism as an economic and social system.